get started. Um, if you if the schools can mute their microphones for a few minutes, I will um, get us started here, and then I'll I'll contact each one of the schools individually and let you introduce yourselves and uh, welcome you to the program. So if if we can get the schools to mute them their microphones, we won't have so much background noise. Um, my name is Linda Rosenblum. I'm with the National Park Service, and I'm the moderator for the uh, PPSP, the Presidential Primary Sources Project. This is our second year that we've um, worked together, and today we're doing Theodore Roosevelt, Making Peace and War, and um, we are coming to you from the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickens State University in North Dakota. Uh, the partners involved in the project here are the National Park Service, the National Archives and Records Administration's Presidential Library, Internet 2, and James, you want to forward? There we go. The Magpie Network and Blue Jeans, which is hosting our bridges for us today. Uh, the next screen that you'll see will be uh, a disclaimer statement, um, which indicates that anyone who participates in this program today, the schools are responsible to make sure that they have um, the permission for the students to, to participate and that their images, voices will be both live on this interactive video conference and will also be recorded and available to stream on an archive for uh, future use for educational projects. The whole world can see you right now. All right, and um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and call each school individually, and we would like um, a representative from each of the schools that I call to step forward to the microphone and introduce yourself, and you can then uh, say what class you're in and where you're from. So we're going to start today with um, the Craig Public Library in Craig, Alaska. Are you with us? Hi, we're with you. Hi, do you have any students with you today? No, I've got two coming though. I just got a call from okay. my dad. All right, thanks for joining us and we'll check back with you later. Um, the next next side we'll be talking to is the Wilton Public School. Is Wilton on the line with us today? Yes, they are. Hi, would someone yes. like to introduce your class? Hi, Wilton. Uh, this is, would you? Hi, this is the Wilton. Go ahead. This is the Wilton sixth grade their teacher and we have 12 students. Great, and what's the teacher's name? Mr. Yetterbold. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, can you keep your mic on mute then when you're not talking so we won't get any um, background noise as well? Uh, Maplewood yep. Richmond Heights. Do we yep. have someone from Maplewood Richmond Heights? There we go. We do. Like Say hi guys. Hi. Hi. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Would someone like to introduce your class and tell us who your teacher is and where you're from? Our teacher, we're from Maple Richmond Heights, Missouri. Um, our teacher is Patrice Bryan, and our class is Semester of Service. And what grade are you in? I am an 11th grader, but we have all different grades in this class. It's all high school? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining us. All Angels Academy, are you with us today? Do we have anyone from All Angels Academy this afternoon? All right, we'll move on. Uh, downtown High School in San Francisco. Do we have anyone from Downtown High School? Okay, uh, one more. We've got uh, Meyer Middle School in Texas. Do we have Meyer Middle School on the line? Meyer's Middle School is connected, but they're having some uh, technology issues. They have 30 students. Okay. Thank you. What grades are they in? I believe it's middle school. I'm not sure the exact okay. grade. And who's the rabbit that I'm seeing here? Oh, that's Region 11. <laughs> We're connecting Denton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, do I have anyone else that we didn't call that's that's with us this morning or this afternoon? Yes. Um, Hi. You have us. 
in Hollis, Alaska. We joined just a couple or yesterday, so you probably don't have us on there. Okay, and what's the name of your school? Um, well, we're homeschool. Uh, this is the Hollis Public okay. Library that we're at, and we're a homeschool of uh, two children. Great. Thanks for joining us. What grades are we in? Go ahead. Say. What one say? Fifth grade and seventh grade. Thank you. And I'm Mrs. I'm Mrs. Carter, their teacher. Thank you. So it's Hollis Public Library. I will add you to the list. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so we're ready to get started at this time, and um, we'll ask that the schools keep your microphones on mute while um, our presenters from the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University uh, do their presentation. And throughout the uh, throughout the presentation, they will be um, asking the school some questions. So uh, have someone ready to uh, respond, and someone that can uh, go up to the microphone and answer the questions or um, respond when they call on you. So at this time, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dickinson State. Well, thank you, Linda. And welcome, everybody, to Dickinson, North Dakota. I have to give a quick shout out to those in Wilton. Uh, we're glad to see a North Dakota school participating today and delighted to have people from everywhere from Alaska to Florida. So we're just really pleased to be able to talk with you today. It's a beautiful spring day in here in North Dakota. Um, we would like to get a, to know a little bit about all of you as well. Um, so if you in your classrooms would just um, please raise your hand if you have ever been to North Dakota. Now, obviously, those in Wilton, we, we don't count there. <laughs> Okay, so so there's there's a few. Um, how about uh, if you've ever heard of? Hopefully that gets everybody in the action. Um, we realize we're off the beaten track, and we were off the beaten track in Theodore Roosevelt's day as well. So um, if I could just ask if anyone knows uh, what is Theodore Roosevelt's connection to North Dakota, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our friends in Wilton to to plug in here. Hopefully somebody there knows. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's connection to North Dakota. Can can we get a spokesman from Wilton to answer that question? Yeah, Morgan, go ahead. So what Morgan, was Theodore I'll Roosevelt's be... connection? Well, that was one of his favorite spots to hang out, and that's where he had a ranch. That's right. He had a ranch in North Dakota. He was here for about four years off and on. He would switch between North Dakota and New York. And then he returned to New York and pursued his political career. But he would always come back to North Dakota throughout his life. His last visit was just a few months before he died. And he would often say he would never have been president were it not for the experiences he had here in North Dakota. And so we're very proud of that. And Dickinson State University is the closest uh, academic uh, institution next to his ranch. It's about 40 miles west of our um, city, Dickinson, North Dakota. And uh, so the, the Theodore Roosevelt Center is working to digitize all of Theodore Roosevelt's documents and artifacts. Because um, as you know, if, if you think about the presidential libraries, they preserve the, docu the documents and artifacts of a, an American president. And uh, for that system was put in place in the 1950s and presidents before that time don't have that kind of an organization. So what we're doing for Theodore Roosevelt is, is we're gathering up those documents and artifacts, but we're not doing it physically. We're scanning them and photographing them and putting them up online so you have access to them. And so today we're gonna look at a number of those documents that illustrate Roosevelt's leadership in two very distinct situations. And to start us off today, I want to introduce you to a colleague of mine, Marlo Sexton. Marlo is a new staff member with the Theodore Roosevelt Center. She's just been here about three weeks. And so we're really delighted to have her. And she's going to kick us off and get us started thinking about Roosevelt's leadership and talking about the Russo-Japanese War. Marlo? Thanks, Sharon. All right. Well, now we know a little bit more about Theodore Roosevelt. I want to see what you already know. So I'd like each spokesperson in each class to get ready with either your memory or a pen and paper. And I want each class to name and list as many leadership roles as you can. Leadership roles that Theodore Roosevelt had during his lifetime. 
And then I'm going to ask each spokesperson to report back to me with the number of leadership roles you could come up with as a group. So if you're all ready with your microphones on mute, thinking about how many leadership roles Theodore Roosevelt had during his lifetime, ready to make your list? Get set. You have 30 seconds. Go. You might want to put your mics on mute so that the other groups don't hear you. If you're not on mute, your answers are going to get taken from other groups. All right, 30 seconds is up. Now, let me see. Um, the Maplewood Richmond Heights High School. Can your spokesperson tell us how many leadership rules could you come up with? We could only come up with two. <laughs> and what was the first one on your list? President. All right. I like that answer. Let's see what other people came up with. Um, the Wilton Public School, how long is your list? We have three. And what was the first one on your list? The same one as the school before us. What President. President. Thank you. Good work. Um, the Craig Public Library. Was anybody there to list Roosevelt's leadership roles? Yes. Go for it. And how president. many leadership roles? Yeah. President? Okay. He was the colonel. Oh, yes, he was. So you came up with a few. How many did you come up with total? Three. <laughs> Three? All right. We can work with that as long as president was on the list. And the Hollis uh, Library. What did you guys come up with? Uh, president and the governor and the colonel. Okay, I like that too. Another three and president was tops on your list. Thank you. Good work. Uh, so I don't have to push the topic too hard. Theodore Roosevelt was the 26th president of the United States from 1901 to 1909. Good work. Now, we remember Theodore Roosevelt as a leader for a lot of reasons. In the United States, Roosevelt was a leader of uh, creating labor laws, consumer protection laws that help us out today, a leader of conservation and conserving our natural resources, and a leader taming big business. But he was also a leader on the international scene. During this time, Roosevelt not only felt an obligation to make sure the priority of the welfare of the United States was one of his top priorities, but he also wanted to make sure that the United States could rise up as a power around the world. And he felt an obligation to make sure that other powers around the world were at peace and balanced. And Roosevelt felt that his leadership meant he needed to look out for the United States, but also police the powers around the rest of the world. Fortunately, at this time, because the United States is so far away from Europe or Asia, the United States wasn't really involved in many international crises. At least we could limit what crises we were involved with. But Roosevelt wanted his chance to be a great leader. One historian said that Roosevelt had hopes for some momentous event that would enable him to stand with Washington and Lincoln in the pantheon of American heroes. The closest he got during his presidency was an international crisis called the Russo-Japanese War. We're fortunate enough to have um, a couple of uh, documents and images that tell us about that war. So let's take a look at a political cartoon about the Russo-Japanese War. Are you seeing my cartoon? Go ahead and hit it again. There we go. All right. I would like to ask um, someone from, who did I talk to before? All right, someone from uh, Maplewood Heights. 
Would you care to be our spokesperson and help me interpret this cartoon? You can take your mic off mute. All right, so let's take a look at this cartoon together. I'm going to tell you first that this is called the Old Salt Salutes, and that is Neptune, the god of the sea. Who is he saluting? Japanese. How do you know? The flag on the front of the ship. Okay, that works. Now, you might want to consult your classmates. My next question is a little bit tough. What do you assume happened based on this cartoon? Look in the background. There was a flood. What? It's a submarine. They don't put a submarine. Yeah, no. It's hard to see. Oh, what's going on in the background there? Is that smoke? Is it smoke? Yeah, there's smoke. Sank into the water. Oh. Does it look like the ruins of war in the background? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it yeah. does. So we can't see that well from our current perspective. So I'm sorry. No problem. Some of these pictures are tough. So let's figure this out. Um, something got destroyed, and Japan is being saluted from the ocean. What do you think happened? Maybe a battle? And who won? The Japanese. Yes. Thank uh, you. Good work. We'll keep going. I've got a few more cartoons that we can talk about later. You can put your mic on mute now. Thank you. So we figured it out. The Russo-Japanese War had just begun. This uh, cartoon was actually published on the front of a magazine in March of 1904, one month before that. The Japanese had surprise attacked the Russians at Port Arthur. It was a Navy attack, and the Japanese, given a surprise attack, were victorious at that time. But uh, this was the beginning of a war. Now I'll tell you that people from Asia, Europe, and even American ambassadors had tried to prevent this war from happening, but the war continued anyway. Through the next year, land and sea battles would take their toll on both Russia and Japan. One land battle actually resulted in 150,000 casualties. That's like the entire population of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or uh, Syracuse, New York, in one battle. In the middle of the war, President Theodore Roosevelt of the United States decided to step up and offer his, his good uh, skills to mediate an agreement and a negotiation between Russia and Japan. But the war continued. By May of 1905, both countries were exhausted. Russia was on the brink of a political revolution at home, and the Japanese Navy was exhausted. Neither country could afford to continue this war. So the Japanese decided to come back, back to President Roosevelt, and they asked him if he would take up that offer now, if he could mediate an agreement, a meeting to negotiate peace between Russia and Japan, but he had to keep it a secret. So Roosevelt decided he would do the best he could. Now, in Roosevelt's day, international diplomacy was not easy. It was very formal and a very structured um, culture. Roosevelt wanted to get straight to the point, though. So he um, used great tact and judgment in approaching both countries. And he tried his best to be respectful, but very direct in getting both countries to agree to make peace. Roosevelt was known for this type of diplomacy, um, a, a personal type of diplomacy, and that was the key. That was what was going to help him negotiate between these two very proud nations. Roosevelt made the most of uh, what he had, and uh, what he had was not a very good system. He had to be very careful about who he trusted. He only had a few trusted ambassadors around the world. So whenever he got information, he had to decide if this was good information, who the source was, and if he was sending out secret messages to other leaders, he had to be super careful about who he was giving those messages to. 
On top of that, you might think the Secretary of State would deal with these types of foreign affairs, but Theodore Roosevelt's Secretary of State was deathly ill and actually resigned and passed away while these negotiations were about to be made. Although Roosevelt appointed a new Secretary of State, he had to take over that job. He had to make sure these arrangements happened on his own. That's unusual leadership for a president in a crisis. So Roosevelt had to send his messages to the Tsar of Russia and the uh, Emperor of Japan. He decided he agreed to make negotiations, so he might as well make it look like uh, it was his idea. He convinced the Tsar to agree to meet the Japanese and discuss a possible treaty. This was a difficult process, and Roosevelt recounted this in a letter that he wrote to his daughter. If we take a look at that letter, No, my letter's not, okay, here we go. <laughs> Here's the letter. He said that uh, he had to send letters and write time after time as a very polite but also insistent Dutch uncle. That's very, very stern and straight to the point, but he tried to stay friendly. Uh, he said, whenever I wrote a letter to the Tsar, the Russians were sure to divulge it, almost always in a twisted form, but the outside world never had so much as a hint to any letter that I sent the Japanese. So he was writing back and forth, getting both sides to agree with him, and doing a lot of it in secret. Roosevelt finally got the Tsar to accept his uh, offer to negotiate. Um, Japan, obviously, had accepted his offer to mediate. Now the question was, where was this going to happen? Both Russia and Japan could only agree on one place. Washington, D.C. Well, let me ask uh, for hands of anybody who's been to Washington, D.C. Has anyone been to Washington, D.C. in the summertime? All right. The weather was a big part of why Roosevelt didn't want to have negotiations there. It was going to be hot and humid, and Roosevelt wasn't going to be there. Theodore Roosevelt spent most of his summers at... Uh, his family home called Sagamore Hill at Oyster Bay, Long Island. Let's take a look at what Sagamore Hill looks like. It's known for the porch and the veranda around the house. Has anyone visited Sagamore Hill? Okay. Well, Sagamore Hill is much more pleasant than Washington in the summertime. Um, and talks were going on. Um, the media was on top of the fact that there would be a negotiating meeting. And the next question was, where would it be? So <laughs> the newspaper got on top of that. And we have a cartoon made with a proposal on where peace might be made. Let's take a look at that cartoon together. And if I could have someone from the Wilton Public School help me out here, I've got a little poem I'd like you to read for us. Who's my Wilton Public School representative? Me. Are you? You? We. All right. This is our cartoon about how the negotiations might be made. You can see that uh, they're proposing people sitting on the veranda of Sagamore Hill and doing a couple of competitions. Now, the people who would be meeting to make these negotiations, they were ambassadors, they were foreign ministers, but we tend to call them plenipotentiaries. This is a word that means a representative who has the full authority of their nation and their emperor, so they can come out and make decisions and sign peace treaties. Now that we know what a plenipotentiary is, I would like you to read us this funny poem about where the peace negotiations should happen. Hit it. Why, is it. why sizzle at the capital or sweller on Pomatic shore when comfort dwells with the dells and breezy groves at Sagamore, here on the famous porch of Ted within the olive branch shade, 
with Vogue to pass the shoot, huh? Oh. With Vogue to pass the shooting glass, smoothing glass. A treaty might be quickly made. And what do you see there? Who's what in the middle of that chair? picture? Yeah, that's Roosevelt in his chair with the plenipotentiaries. Do you see what they did to the word there? What did they call the plenipotentiaries in this poem? I don't know. It's in the title. Do you see the word in the title? To the potential. I can't even pronounce it. Teddy potentiaries. <laughs> They're making a joke. They threw his name into it. Our teddy bear, our Theodore, the teddy potentiaries. So they were making a joke that uh, maybe, maybe they could all get together at Sagamore Hill. Thank you for reading that poem to us. That's our poetry reading of the day. Now, um, let's take a look at where this meeting finally happened. It wasn't going to happen at Sagamore Hill. Would you want to have an international peace meeting happen at your house? Theodore Roosevelt decided that the meeting had to happen at a place on the east coast of the United States, a place with top security and access to international communications and hopefully a place not far from President Roosevelt in case they needed more advice from him along the way. So the place they decided on was Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Theodore Roosevelt invited the plenipotentiaries, the representatives who would make this treaty happen, to his house first. But like I said, international diplomacy was very formal. People were worried about who would sit closer to Theodore Roosevelt? Who would enter the room first? Who would be toasted to? So Roosevelt decided to forget all that. He would make sure there was no way for one country to be offended by the other. Roosevelt met the plenipotentiaries on a boat not far from his house. And he decided that, sorry, we're gonna cut to the chase here. He decided that uh, he would meet them so that nobody would worry about who stepped in front of the other uh, plenipotentiary. Roosevelt grabbed both the Japanese and Russian uh, envoys by their arms and started chatting up a storm so he wouldn't even pay attention and remember who had stepped in front of who. Then Roosevelt decided, so we don't have to worry about seating arrangements. We'll eat lunch standing up. And then Roosevelt decided, so we don't have to worry about who toasts to whom, he would make a simple toast to peace and need no reply. After Roosevelt welcomed both of these groups, he stayed home at Sagamore Hill while he sent the plenipotentiaries on to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The negotiations continued, meetings happened, and occasionally throughout August, um, the ministers and ambassadors would actually come to visit Theodore Roosevelt and ask him what terms they should negotiate. When no negotiation could be reached, Roosevelt decided it was time for him to take the initiative and step up to a higher power. Roosevelt started sending messages to the Russian Tsar himself, asking him to make negotiations with the Japanese terms of agreement. When Russia, sorry, Roosevelt's ambassador wasn't helping any, Roosevelt decided to use one of his friends, the Kaiser of Germany, and ask him to convince the Tsar to make these agreements. By the end of August, it looked like there was no peace in sight. Russia didn't want to give up, Japan didn't want to give up, because neither nation wanted to be responsible for continuing the war, and Theodore Roosevelt was persistent in his own right. Finally, after terms were negotiated, in the first week of September 1905, the Treaty of Portsmouth was signed. And although not everybody was happy, leaders around the world acknowledged Theodore Roosevelt for his wonderful work, his personal diplomacy, and his ceaseless efforts to make peace happen. Here we see Roosevelt um, writing a letter to his daughter about a message he got. 
The Russian Tsar actually told him, accept my congratulations and warmest thanks for having brought the peace negotiations to a successful conclusion, owing to your personal energetic efforts. That's Theodore Roosevelt. That's Theodore Roosevelt at work with his energy, personal diplomacy, and commitment to peace. The world recognized Theodore Roosevelt the next year as he became the first American to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. And at home, we recognize Theodore Roosevelt as the peacemaker. In our digital collection, we have access to um, sheet music of the song, The Peacemaker March, which you actually heard at the beginning of our presentation. Throughout Roosevelt's presidency, he had been looking for some kind of crisis so he could step up to bat and become a great leader. As he was able to use personal diplomacy and turn the Russo-Japanese War into the peace at Portsmouth, he helped balance powers around the world. However, 10 years later, that balance of power would fall apart. 10 years later, Theodore Roosevelt would decide now is a time to make war and join the war efforts. But 10 years later, Theodore Roosevelt wasn't president anymore. How could he exercise leadership to make war? Jaren, I think you have the answer for us. Thank you, Marlo. And thank you for that great review of the Russo-Japanese War and how Roosevelt exercised leadership during that crisis. Um, as Marla mentioned, it's now 10 years later. The Great War, or what we now call today World War I, broke out in August 1914. Nine months later, this headline that we're going to look at appeared in the World newspaper. Okay? Two torpedoes sink the Lusitania. This was a huge ocean liner. Nearly 1,500 people died, many of them Americans. And what's the last line here in this headline? The president stunned in seclusion. Okay. Again, this is not President Roosevelt. This is President Woodrow Wilson. Circumstances were very different. So... Did this incident bring the U.S. into the war? How did we respond to Germany's aggression? Again, this was a passenger liner. It was carrying munitions. That was part of the reason for the attack. But many innocent civilians died in this attack. How did we respond? And what was TR doing during this time, given that he wasn't president? He couldn't lead at this moment. The next item we're going to look at is an essay that Roosevelt wrote called To the American People. This excerpt from the essay starts out, 14 months have elapsed since we sent our strict accountability note to Germany demanding that there be no submarine warfare that would endanger the lives of American citizens. So President Wilson had sent this warning to Germany before the Lusitania was sunk, okay? He had sent a warning saying that they would be held strictly accountable. And Roosevelt goes on to say here, if, if Germany believed that we meant what we said, she wouldn't have done what she did to the Lusitania and all those lives wouldn't have been lost. So Roosevelt is advocating for American strength and American preparedness to act against these military actions affecting American citizens. Again, Roosevelt is no longer president. He doesn't have what we would call that bully pulpit of the presidency to speak from. But if we step back and we look at this document, so again, this is a primary source we're reading of Roosevelt's writings, and we've just looked at what he's saying here, but we're gonna go one step further and look at the context. Where was he saying this? What was this um, published in, or what, what form? 
So this actually appeared in a book called Fear God and Take Your Own Part. And just looking at the introduction here, it says this book is based primarily upon and mainly consists of matter contained in articles I've written in the Metropolitan Magazine. If you watch the film at the beginning, it showed Roosevelt um, consulting with the editor of that magazine, the Metropolitan, about preparedness for, for the American military. So think about that. Again, Roosevelt isn't president. This great crisis occurs. How can he respond? How can he lead in this circumstance? What, what is he using to try to respond to the situation? Can somebody from Maplewood, Richmond Heights respond there? Give us a, a stab at that. How is Roosevelt leading, given that he's not president any longer? Um, he still had the ability to rally support for the current president or rally support for whatever um, whatever his feelings may be, whatever his view is. He can still rally support for that and kind of be more of just a political group by himself with how good of a leader he was. Okay. And he's using his gift as a writer, his skill, and he's publishing, he's speaking. So he's using the tools that he now has in his toolbox. Again, he doesn't have the presidency anymore. He doesn't have the power and the authority of the presidency. But he's using what he has at hand, his ability to write, his ability to influence the American people with that skill. Okay? So let's look at another type of document. The next one is a letter that TR wrote to President Wilson. Okay? Now, this is difficult to read, I realize, and I'm not going to ask you to for that reason. Uh, it's a handwritten draft. This isn't the actual uh, letter that was sent, clearly. Um, it's written in pencil, and you can see all of Roosevelt's edits as he was writing and thinking. And But what he's saying is, if there's any position in the line of the Army in which I can be of service, I apply to serve in such position for the duration of the war. Okay? So let's stop and think about that. Again, that's the content of the letter. Now we're going to back up and think about the context of this document. How old is TR at this time? Okay, this is after his presidency by about 10 years. He was a fairly young president. If you go on and read further in the letter, he actually mentions his age. He's 58 years old. And he's volunteering to serve in the Army on the fighting line. Okay? So let's go to Hollis, Alaska. How is Roosevelt leading at this moment? What is he doing with this? Can somebody in Hollis take a stab at that? Um, go. go ahead, Cal. Well, he's asking, how, how do you guys think he's leading? He's using his articles? By his articles and um, his volunteer. Yes, OK, so his volunteering the to serve, what is would about that do? To end. What would that do when someone else um, sees that uh, request of, of former President Roosevelt to serve in the military? How would that influence others? How would that influence others, you guys? Uh, have them want to volunteer? Okay, so he's leading by example. He's going to be the first one to volunteer for military service, having uh, offered to or having encouraged military preparedness, he now is going to be the first one to volunteer himself to go on the fighting lines. Now, excuse me, can I, can I yes. ask one question? This is Hollis. Yes. I'm sorry, we just got a message. I don't know if anyone else did, but it said the conference was about to end. Did we yes, call I'm hoping, our... I'm hoping that now. the technicians are handling that because we should have about four or five more minutes. So I, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. Sharon, yes. Thank you. Sharon, you're, this is James. You're, it, the Blue Jeans Bridge is set to continue up to the end of the program, so maybe one of the other bridges that are connected are, are about to drop, but you, you won't drop. Okay. Good news. Thank you, James. So let's take a look at one last document to think about how Roosevelt led during the circumstances around World War I. Take a look at this photograph. If you're able to read the, the type at the top, it says that on this banner, it says it's a pledge to buy war saving stamps to the utmost of your ability. So the people signing this are pledging to use their money to invest in the war effort, okay? And who's the person signing? 
Can you see the beginning of the signature? It's President Roosevelt, former President Theodore Roosevelt. So again, that's the content of what's happening, but let's look at the context around it. And we're gonna do that just within the document itself. Think about, is TR sitting at his desk at Sagamore Hill signing this document privately, quietly? Okay, where is this happening? If you look at the crowd gathered around, it sort of looks like maybe this is a public square or a street, there's this whole crowd of people watching. It's a very public setting, very public venue. And look down in the lower left-hand corner. Who, who do you see down there? Somebody at the Craig Public Library? What do you see in the lower left corner? Who's the gen what's that gentleman holding? What's he got? He's camera. got a camera. camera. Yeah, he's got a camera. Yeah. This is a guy that is a reporter for a magazine or a newspaper, right? This is the media that's covering this event. So, and you know who this is? Is that a Boy Scout? Oh, do we have Boy Scouts in the picture? I'm so looking, here I'm is Roosevelt in this very public setting using the tools yeah. that he has now, which in this case is the media and this his whole public persona, his popularity, to influence Americans to support the war effort. Okay? So we've looked at several different illustrations of how Roosevelt is leading in this situation around World War I. It's very different from what he did with the Russo-Japanese War. And so we're just gonna try to pull this together and summarize in these last couple minutes here. Um, did we ever get Meyer Middle School connected? Is Meyer Middle School with us? It doesn't sound like it. We'll go back to uh, Wilton then. Wilton, let's just summarize, if you would, how did Roosevelt lead during the situation in the Russo-Japanese War? How would you describe that? What did you do, Courtney? He made peace. Okay, he made peace. How did he go about trying to accomplish that? Who was he communicating with in that circumstance? Go ahead. The Japanese and the Russians. Okay, but who in Japan and who in Russia? Go ahead, in the back of the room. They're leaders. Yes, the leaders. Because he was the American president, he had the power and authority of the president to com presidency to communicate directly with other world leaders. So he used that personal diplomacy that Marlowe talked about. He used the tool that he had available during that time. Okay, very good. Let's switch over to um, Maplewood Richmond Heights again. Can you summarize how Roosevelt uh, led during World War I? How did he exercise influence and leadership there? He really just used um, his influential name to go and uh, be an advocate for the war. He went out and would do, he would make a point to show people how much he supported it so that the people that supported him would also support the war, therefore gaining support for the country. Excellent. Well done. So you can see how Roosevelt was a very practical, pragmatic politician. He used the tools he had in the moment. And I, I guess what I would encourage is for all of you, uh, particularly you at Maplewood Heights, you're, you're uh, in your semester of service. When you think about that, how do each of us lead? How do we use the skills that we have? And how do we use the tools that we have in the moment to accomplish our ends and to influence people? So Roosevelt's a great model for that. And that concludes what we have to, for you today. Uh, if, I'm gonna ask Linda from the National Park Service, the moderator, to um, let us know if we have a couple minutes for questions or um, if we need to wrap up here. Linda? Yeah, we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll uh, go through each one of the schools and invite each school to either ask a question or uh, to s sign off and say goodbye, and then we'll wrap it up. So. Um, let's go ahead and start with Craig, Alaska. Does someone at the library there in Craig have any questions for our presenters today? I don't. Nope. I don't. Nope. nope, no questions. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. All right, our next uh, Wilton Public School, do you have any questions uh, for our presenter today?
Wilton, are you with us still? Is it on me or is it on content? Okay. All right. I, let's let's move on. I, I don't think we have Wilton on the line anymore. Uh, Maplewood in uh, Missouri, would you like to uh, ask any questions of our presenters? I do not have any questions, but I'd like to thank them for their time. So thank you guys. Thank, right, thank, thank you, you for joining us. Um, who else do we have here? Uh, Hollis Public Library. Any questions for our thank presenters? You. Thank you. No, we don't. Thank you for but joining really us. Liked, Anyone? Really liked the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Meyer Middle School, do we still have anyone from Meyer? All right, and I'll go back one more time. Wilton, are you back with us? Wilton Public School, would you like to uh, say goodbye or ask any questions? All right, um, James, you want to go ahead and put up our, our ending slides and we'll... We'll finish up here. There we go. All right, so we want to thank each of the schools and libraries that have joined us today. We hope that you'll be able to uh, register and participate in a couple of future events. And we want to thank our partners, Internet2, Magpie, Blue Jeans Network, National Park Service, and the Presidential Libraries, uh, as well as Dickinson State, for uh, participating in the uh, project that we're doing this year this uh, school year and you can see our address up there our uh, url is, is on the screen for you if you want to participate in a future event we have two more coming up this school year uh, april 15th we have the herbert hoover national historic site and library doing a joint presentation and then on april 30th we'll have a presentation from the eisenhower uh, national historic site in gettysburg pennsylvania and um, we're glad that you joined us today, and we're going to be uh, signing off at this time. Thank you.